wanted to introduce to you another one of our um, new contributors, Joe Wolverton. Uh, he has been a longtime writer for the New American Magazine, a staunch constitutionalist. And uh, here in this presentation, in this uh, podcast, he does a really great job of breaking down what the Founding Fathers said was the solution to restoring liberty. I really suggest that you take a really good look at it. This is what we are doing at Defending Utah. We have followed the example of those that have gone before that have actually, you know, uh, been successful at being able to bring about liberty where there was lacking and following their example. Without further ado, Joe Wolverton. Teacher of Liberty Joe Wolverton here. I'm coming to you today with a really important topic. Um, when I go out and talk and when I teach classes, the question I get asked most often is, how can we restore liberty? It's great that you tell me that we should. It's great that the founders want, cared so much about liberty that they fought for it. It's great so much that people that they read love liberty. But how do we do it? How do we do it? So the answer is twofold. So that's what this whole this, ver this video will be about how do we go about restoring liberty in 2019, 2020, 2021 going forward. The answer is twofold. First, there is no liberty without virtue. So if you are committed to the restoration of liberty, you must be equally as committed to maintaining your personal virtue. A virtuous people would never consent to be ruled over by a tyrant. So, if we want to get rid of a tyrant, we must increase our personal virtue. That's step one, all right? Because it's like Sidney said, right? Algernon Sidney. If you want to get rid of tyrant, you don't kill a tyrant. You must get rid of the tyranny, which means you must get rid of the people's willingness to submit to tyranny. Because if you kill a tyrant, there'll just be another one come to take his place. You must get rid of the people's willingness to submit to a tyrant. And that is by increasing the people's virtue individually. We have to be committed in our homes and in our lives to be more virtuous. Okay, that's the first step. The second step is that assuming that we're diligently working on being virtuous, the, the step to, we must take after that is to reestablish the sovereign borders of the states. We must, as I say time and time again, we must make America states again. Right? This is a concept called federalism, and it is central to the Constitution. We do not have a consolidated nation. We have a confederated, a confederation of sovereign republics. That's what we should have. All right. Now, so work on our virtue. Assuming we're working on that, we've got to reestablish the sovereignty of the states. Okay. So I get asked that question so much though, regarding how do we restore liberty that I actually wrote a book about it. The book is based on Federalist number 46, which I call the book, What Degree of Madness, which is a question Madison asked in that Federalist paper. Now, the book, by the way, will be published by Shotwell Press. It'll be coming out in January, right? Uh, I'll let you know exactly when, whenever it's ready to go, I'll let you know. But it'll be available everywhere, Shotwell Publishing. You can look that up. It'll be available in January. Now, I call the book, What Degree of Madness, because that's the question. Hello, little Jimmy. Yes, you, you were wondering, how crazy? Uh, do you think Americans are crazy? Yeah. Do you think we ought to be? No. So, Madison asks in Federalist 46, how crazy would Americans have to be in order to see tyranny come to the, come to the United States and yet not only endure the tyranny, but continue to fund the tyrant. He said, this would never happen in America. We're far too virtuous and we love liberty far too much, he says. Sorry, Jimmy. 
close, you might want to close your eyes for the next bit. We have let him down. But a good thing that good Brother Madison did in Federalist number 46 is he said, let's assume you do go crazy. I'm going to give you a list of weapons that he described as, quote, powerful and at hand, meaning powerful and very close, handy, that we could use, that the states could use to fight against federal tyranny, right? So he didn't think we'd ever be this crazy, but just in case, he said, because that's what he is, just in case, I'm going to list out these weapons that the states can use. They are powerful and they are at hand. And they can use this to force the federal beast back inside its constitutional cage. Trademark. All right. First of these weapons, the disquietude of the people. Now, those of you who've had my class, you know I don't allow Teflon words. I don't want... Some of y'all are not going to know what Teflon is because you're like 12. Teflon is what they used to put on pans to make stuff not stick on them. So I had a professor once in college, and he, he's the one who taught me this. He's Teflon, don't have, when you read difficult texts, don't let there be Teflon words. Don't read things that slide off you. So make sure that if you're going to understand difficult texts, make sure you look up things you don't know the meaning of. So disquietude of the people. Now, in 1785... So just a couple of years before the Constitutional Convention, a few years before Madison wrote Federalist 46 in 17, uh, well, 17, 17, 1787 in October. So just a couple of years before that, Samuel Johnson had come out with his dictionary. So I looked it up. I got a copy of the 1785 Samuel Johnson Dictionary. And I'm, what does disquietude mean to little Jimmy? So disquietude, uneasiness, anxiety, disturbance, want of tranquility. So the first weapon, powerful weapon, that Madison says we can use to fight against federal tyranny is disquietude, uneasiness, anxiety, disturbance, want of tranquility. So if we were determined to do this, the first we would become uneasy. Second, we would get anxious about the attack on our liberty. Third, we would cause a disturbance. And fourth, this uneasy, anxious disturbance would deprive the despots of their tranquility. In other words, there would be no peace until the federal authority retreated back inside the borders of its own constitutional territory. A disquiet people would not simply sit around and shake their fists at the television as a president, a congressman, or a court repeals their God-given rights. A disquiet people would not simply sit down and type out a cleverly worded social media post calling out the unconstitutionality of the latest federal act. A disquiet people would not be content complaining for two or four years until the next congressional or presidential election afforded them the opportunity to vote the bums out. A disquiet people would not put their faith in the arm of flesh, whether it be the flesh of a political party or the flesh of a preferred candidate. A, disqualified pe a disquiet people would not be mollified by milquetoast state officials whose lips draw nigh unto nullification of the federal government's effrontery to the state's sovereignty, but whose hearts are secretly set on serving the supreme power on the Potomac so as to secure some regal recognition and reward for their obedience to the overlords. A disquiet people would not passively put up with some small act of autocracy satisfying themselves with their patriotic pride about living in a republic. A disquiet people would not fearfully plead with Washington, D.C. to protect them from the manifold menaces roaming the earth. A disquiet people would not sing some ancient hymn praising the virtue and virility of patriots of the past while living a life of effeminate and affluent dissociation with the courage 
of their forebears. To put it bluntly, we would not act like we act today. Now, second weapon, repugnance. Now, what does repugnance mean? Johnson, again in his dictionary, says it means disobedience, resisting compliance. You put that together and you see that Madison thought that we would be so aware of the value of our liberty. We would be so keenly protected of the prerogatives of our state that we would refuse to be obedient or compliant with any federal act that exceeded its constitutional authority. Number three, the third weapon, refusal to cooperate with the officers of the union. Now, this is a big one, guys. This is a doctrine called anti-commandeering by the Supreme Court. Now, I don't believe the Supreme Court has the right to decide what's constitutional, what isn't, particularly when it violates the Constitution or violates the will of the states or the representatives of the people. But this anti-commandeering is basically this. The federal government cannot force the state to spend its own resources to enforce federal policies and programs. There is no way, guys, that the federal government could enforce the multitude of unconstitutional gun regulations without state and local cooperation. Period. There is no way the NSA could run that massive data center in Utah without the cooperation of the town that provides water to cool all the computers. There is no way that the federal government could monitor whether or not you're digging a pond on your own property without the cooperation of local and state authorities. Were we to do what Madison suggests and refuse to cooperate with the officers of the Union, there would be very few federal programs and policies that the federal government could enforce on its own with its own resources. I'm not talking about money. Heaven knows they steal enough of that and they print enough of it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about manpower. Agents going out. Those red flag laws, they're not carried out by ATF agents from D.C. or even from your federal agents in your state. They're carried out by local law enforcement, state law enforcement. We must refuse to cooperate. Why? Because we didn't consent to that. And if you, there's only two ways a man gets authority over another man, consent or force. The first makes us equals. The second, if I obey you, makes me your slave. Ain't no way. Four, frowns of the executive magistracies. That's talking about governors of the state. Can you imagine, guys? Imagine, if you will, come with me on this journey. Take my hand and off we'll stride to this magical state where the governor receives the latest dictate from the plutocrats on the Potomac. Ahem. Yes, um, we must go round collecting guns from everyone who's ever written anything bad about the federal government. We must do this for the safety of the children. Well, and the government would then frown. No, 
I can't, I don't know how to frown. How do you frown? Mm. He would frown. Can you imagine that? I would move to that state tomorrow. Instead of frowns of the executive magistracies, instead of governors frowning, refusing to carry out the orders sent down from Washington, D.C., what happens today? Governors nod like little puppies waiting for the treat that they think they've earned for rolling over and playing dead like the master told them to do. We need governors that know how to frown. Instead of Governor Brown, we need Governor Frown. Maybe he should run Encyclopedia Frown for Governor. Governor Frown. Trademark. Five, the fifth weapon, legislative devices. This is Madison's way of saying nullification. Simply put, it's this. And you Google my name and nullification if you want to get an education on the whole concept. But for the video, I'm going to be quick because I looked at the stats. Y'all watching about 18 minutes of these. I, I'm not going to go 30 minutes. And, have, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean I want to give you what you want. All right? That's the, that's the importance of this, getting the message out. So legislative devices means nullification. That means every act of the federal government that exceeds its enumerated powers in the Constitution, the states refuse to enforce, right? They nullify. They say that is not even a thing. If, it, if the federal government stays within the four corners of the Constitution, then the states are obliged morally to obey because we said we would in the Constitution. In the four corners, we said, here's the list of things, federal government, as our agent, as our servant, that we said you're allowed to do. And if you do those things, then we're going to do it. But if you go outside those four corners of that document, we won't do those things. That's called nullification. And that's what he means by legislative devices. The legislatures of the states can say, no. We're not going to enforce red flag laws. No, we're not going to enforce clean water regulations. No, we're not going to make sure that someone doesn't dig a pond on their property. No, we're not going to make doctors ask their patients if they own weapons or go to church, look it up. We're not going to do that. And they use legislative devices. So you have the governor frowning and you have the legislature saying, no, you have the people being disquiet. Remember what that means, right? Uneasy, want of tranquility, all of that anxious. No, we're not doing that. They're repugnant. They're like, <laughs> we're not obeying. We're not complying with that, right? You refuse to cooperate with the officers of the union. We're not using local and state resources to enforce unconstitutional acts of the federal government. Then you have the governor frowning, and you have the legislature using their devices to say, no. We're not enforcing it. We're not passing. We're passing resolution. We're not doing what you say because it's not in the four corners. Not because we're being rebellious, you understand. Supporting the Constitution's enumerated powers is not rebellion, people, despite the fact that so many conservatives act like it is. Enforcing the enumerated powers of the Constitution is what men of his generation died for because it supports the concept of a free man property liberty that's the essence of freedom this is mine because I earned it and I get to say what happens to it all right so the the last weapon that he mentions is the states joining in unison so you have Arizona that says, you know, the people get disquiet, they get repugnant, that we refuse to cooperate with the officers of the union, the governor frowns, not the governor we have now, heaven knows, the legislature passes devices redrawing the borders around Arizona, 
and around the Constitution, the federalism. And then all those people that love liberty, guess where they're coming? To Arizona. And all those people who want to benefit from the tyranny, guess where they're leaving? Arizona. It'll be just like Thales, you remember? Like Hergus asked him why there are no bad people. He's like, because they don't, they don't get anything here. They don't like it here. No one pays attention to them. In Arizona, if we restored, if we took these five tools, the sixth, these five weapons, the sixth would happen because other states would be like, hey, Arizona, look what's happening. The people are happy. They're prosperous. The economic stability is insane. Wages are going up. Everything. Other states would want to stand and use these weapons and stand in unison with us. We wouldn't be standing alone. A David against the Goliath. There'd be lots of Davids. And still just that one Goliath. If we do it, somebody's got to do it. It's like I say in class, some of you are just going to be like, Joey, we've heard it. In school, what happens? You're taking a test, everybody sits there till one guy gets up and breaks the seal, right? One guy gets up, turns in his test, suddenly 20 people are done at the same time. Rubbish. Everybody was done. It's just nobody wanted to be the first. Well, let's be the first. Let's be that disquiet people. Let's be that repugnant people. Let's be that refuse to cooperate people. Let's have that frowning governor. Let's have that legislature with those devices. Let's be the first. Let's break the seal and these states will join with us. Now, I know, I gotta move along. You're like, Joey, we get it. All right, so how Madison suggested that states make plans of resistance against a tyrannical federal government. I'll remind you, this is all in my book. I'm giving you a little taste. The book comes out in January. I'm not, I'm just saying there's a lot in the book that I can't get to in this video. All right. So how would the states do this? How would they get to the point where they really can force that federal beast back inside its constitutional cage? Trademark. Number one, they would raise general signals of alarm. They would be like, um, one governor talks to the other, or one legislature communicates to the other, or one man on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or whatever communicates to people and says, this is unconstitutional. There are constitutional ways of fighting this. That's raised general signals of alarm. Guys, this is not, because there's a lot of people who don't know. The advancement and diffusion of knowledge is the only guardian of true liberty. Did you write that? You did. Yes, wonderful. You did such a good job. I will let you stay. We just got to raise general signals of alarm. Get out there, let people know what is and what is not constitutional. Bust out your pocket constitution and say, it's not in there. If it ain't in there, they can't do it. Why? Four corners rule. Why? All men are created equal. The government was created to be my servant, not my master. Number two, espouse the common cause. What's the common cause? The common cause is liberty. This is why people on the right and the left can get behind this. Because all we want to do is be left alone. Stay in your lane. Government, all government. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to know government is there most of the time. It's like what they say in baseball, right? How do you know the umpiring was good in that game? Because you barely noticed it. That's how I want the umpire of government. I want it to be barely noticeable. And this will make people espouse the common cause. Because what, look, liberty is the tide that lifts all boats, yachts to canoes, baby. All boats are lifted by the tide of liberty, trademark. Three, open a correspondence. Get people talking, write posts, whatever. 
correspond, make groups, get together, talk about things. There are groups out there that exist that talk about constitutional issues. Meet with those people, find like-minded people, get with them, open this correspondence so that people can see there are other people out there that care. Open a correspondence. Plans of resistance would be concerted once we all find out that there are people in other states and even in our own state, which is the most important thing, once I find out that I'm not standing here in Mesa or Gilbert or Queen Creek or whatever in Arizona, that I'm not alone, there's other people, then we can start making a concerted plan of resistance. All right, let's all decide, hey, we're not providing water to the NSA. All right, hey, We're going to make it where cops are not carrying out, local cops are not carrying out red flag laws. Plans of resistance can be concerted. The feds would start taking notice. And five, Madison says, if this happens, one spirit would animate and conduct the whole of the American people. Of course, not all of us, because some people just genuinely don't want to be free. But do you understand even that attitude is okay in America? Go. Go to that place where you want to be socialists. Do your thing. But let me and my people be over here being free. With a handshake. With government staying out of our business with the bright lines of state sovereignty redrawn as they once were by our fathers in the Constitution. You see, it's the tide that lifts all boats. One spirit would animate and conduct all of us. Every religion. Every, everything. You can be whatever you want to be Be among people who are like-minded. Imagine the peace that comes from that, y'all. And then think about what it means that there are so many people determined to force us to stay one consolidated country in direct contradiction of the founders and of the Constitution. They're opposed to peace. Think about that. Especially when you think about he who is the prince of peace. If they're opposing that, if they're against Christ. So, let's do it. Let's work hard to be virtuous ourselves. Let's restore liberty by restoring states to their rightful place as creators of the federal government and not vice versa. The states are the creators. The federal government's the creation. The states are the employers. The federal government is the employee. Let's restore that relationship like it should be, as it is set out in the Constitution, as it is set out in Federalist 46. If we want to be free, we can be free. We must remember Madison's weapons. We must remember his plan for deploying them against the tyrants in Washington, D.C. We must remember that if we want to be free, to coin a phrase, we must make America states again. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you later.